Awesome. Thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, welcome to the, uh, the mini symposium on geophysics. Uh, I'm going to talk about modeler in a minute, but I wanted to sort of preface uh, that with a little, um, uh, I don't know, some thoughts, I guess, on the geophysical community. Uh, I, I, I want to almost say burgeoning uh, or newly connected uh, geophysical community, let's say. Um, and that might just be my perception because I'm relatively new to sort of programming and um, computational geoscience. Um, but I feel like um, there's more and more activity that's more and more connected. And we're more and more aware of each other. And in a way, I think this uh, SciPy meeting is sort of a, I hope, can catalyze some more of that um, over the next, um, next year or two. Um, I, uh, I started writing this, uh, or sort of being a sort of loose maintainer, I guess, as much as you can be on Wikipedia, of this wiki page um, a few years ago, right, I think it was right before one of the open source geoscience meetings at a, uh, EAGE in uh, Copenhagen um, a couple of years ago. And uh, several, a few of the people here were, were there too. And... Um, it was just sort of me trying to get my head around all the open source geophysics stuff out there, whether it was for seismic, uh, reflection seismic, which is my main interest, or, um, or for potential fields, or geospatial stuff, or all that kind of thing. So they're sort of loosely classified on here. And um, you know, started to sort of realize, oh, here's the sort of licenses that people are using, here's the sort of languages that people are, people are applying to their work. And, um, it was just a really good way for me to kind of get, get my head around that, that um, geophysical landscape. There's another one for geology, if you're more interested in geology. It's much shorter than this one, uh, though. And, uh, and this was also a really great way to find people to invite here. Um, so I was one of the uh, um, people inviting abstracts to this, uh, this mini symposium. And this was a great way to sort of find those people. And I started to become, you know, more aware of some of the really cool stuff around. So um, uh, we're not necessarily going to hear about all of this stuff today, but some of these people are here. So we've got like Visible Geology, which is Rowan Cockett's awesome web app that, if you haven't seen it, you really need to go look at it. Um, Visible Geology, it's called. Uh, it's very, very cool. And um, and uh, his uh, Pygmy. Um, and we are, I think, going to hear from Patrick Cole, uh, whose project this is, later on. And um, this is uh, Leo Ueda's stuff. He's uh, from, uh, in from Rio. He's going to uh, do a little lightning talk on that right after me about his poster. Um, and uh, I get really excited when I see all this sort of thing because it makes me realize that there's potentially all these awesome hackers around, like geoscience hackers, I guess I mean, because it can tend to feel a little bit isolated. Um, we're, I'm out in Nova Scotia with Evan and uh, Ben Bauer, who are here in the, in the room. And um, you know we're not exactly in a hotbed of geoscience, never mind of geophysical programming. And, um, uh, last sort of few months, we've started trying to get some of those people together, so um, not associated with directly, but um, co-located and co-timed with the SEG annual meeting. It's the Society of Exploration Geophysicists uh, in Houston last year. We held a sort of hackathon um, and basically invited people to come uh, write code together for a couple of days. And... Um, uh, Sergei Fomal, who's, uh, who's here somewhere, uh, has uh, been having some similar events around Madagascar, which is an awesome uh, seismic processing uh, toolbox, open source seismic processing toolbox. Um, you know, so these things are starting to happen. We managed to get 15 people along to this event last fall. We're going to do it again in, in Denver this fall. Um, so, you know, if you're in that area or you go to SEG or you fancy a couple days hacking around with this stuff, then please come along. Uh, here's what I want it to look like. So, uh, if we can get to a point where there's uh, 400 uh, sort of geophysicists playing with sci-fi and stuff, that would be, that'd be wicked. Um, anyway, so, yeah, I'd uh, tell you a little bit about um, the project that we've been working on lately in Agile. Um, and then we'll be hearing from these other characters. So we just move things around a little bit. Actually, Rowan and Leo will be interspersed in a slightly different way, but we'll stick to the rest of the timing um, here. So, uh, so yeah, I want to tell you a bit about a web app that um, Ben and Evan and I started building. Well, we actually started the project a couple of years ago, and then it had a long hiatus. Um, 
and then we picked it up again sort of last fall, about September time, and launched it in a sort of alpha launch, I suppose, in a soft way, basically to our immediate community in March. And um, yeah, so we're still basically developing and trying to figure out, essentially trying to figure out if there's a business there or not. Um, you know, so that we can justify uh, carrying on with it. So we're a small consulting shop, basically. We do geology and geophysics consulting. We do a little bit of um, stuff around knowledge sharing. We publish some books. We write a blog. We do uh, uh, things that sort of interest us. One of the things that interested us a couple of years ago was... Um, this was about 2011, we started playing with mobile apps because I've, well, essentially at the time we were sort of MATLAB hackers, I guess, and then um, we found this tool uh, at the time, it's called Google App Inventor, it's, it's now called uh, MIT App Inventor, and it's a visual programming, block-based programming language or environment, I suppose, like an IDE almost, online, uh, for making Android apps. So uh, at the bottom right there, you can see what the uh, programming environment looks like. It doesn't really look like code to most of you guys. Uh, but for us, it was fantastic because it's actually really powerful. You can build you know, loops and all the control statements you need. You can go out to the web and you can control everything on the phone, contacts, camera. Um, you've got access to the gyro, everything. Um, so it's super powerful, and um, and we started hacking together these little um, apps for geoscientists, and they're basically just little calculators. So they had some number fields, and you press go, and it did some stuff, and uh, mostly showed some numbers. Um, then we came across well. In this app, where we're putting in VP, VS, and rho, so these are velocity, like acoustic velocity, um, shear velocity, and density um, in two rocks, and then we want to compute the reflectivity, so the reflection coefficient at the interface between those two rocks, um, and then convolve them with a wavelet and make a sort of forward model of some seismic. Um, but now. That, that was kind of what we wanted to do. Well, we got as far as computing the reflection coefficients and then wanted to make a graph. And we were like, well, how do we make a graph when all we've got is these blocks? I don't know how to draw a picture. Um, and, uh, and we came across the Google Charts API. So it was a total kind of light bulb revelation to me that I just had to build a URL, send it out on the web, and like, I don't know, two milliseconds later, get back a nice little PNG of the chart that I wanted. I was like, holy crap, that's awesome. Um, and then I thought, well, what I really want is some seismic. Uh, I wish there was a thing out there where I could just submit a URL and get back a little forward model of some seismic data. Um, so that was when we thought, okay, we, we can try and build that thing. Um, actually, at the time, so <laughs> uh, at the time, I did one of the Udacity courses that S Steve Huffman taught. He's one of the founders of Reddit. Um, so the Udacity CS two five three course is totally fantastic because he basically explains about all the crazy mistakes that they made with their database and with their unsecured uh, user passwords and how they discovered they needed to do things like sharding and replication and this kind of thing. And um, anyway, it's a fantastic uh, course. And uh, so, yeah, I'd been playing with Google App Engine, knew how to put up a web server written in Python, which was a language we were starting to figure out that we could actually write things in. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So, I mean, these tools, we were writing the first version of these App Inventor tools in less than a day. You know, you've not, and not just like finished the app, it's like it's in the Google Play or Android market as it was at the time, and people can actually download it and play with it. Um, and Google App Engine is the same kind of idea. You can write stuff in Python, an hour later it's on the web and people are using it, it's pretty cool. Um, anyway, so, it, you know, so anyway, we, we, we got something hacked together in App Engine that could, um, serve these little, these little uh, images. Like I say, the, the, that whole kind of web API thing was a bit of a revelation to me. And one of my sort of secret desires for the geoscience community is that we can stand up these APIs around the web for each other, essentially, and document them and kind of be sympathetic to each other's needs so that, um, I don't know, if I want to do something uh, like get some subsurface data processed or um, get some public well data uh, or look up some obscure acronym that we use in uh, subsurface and find out what the units of a log are, say, um, there's, a, there's an API out there that I can 
point my tool at and uh, get back a little JSON uh, to use in my application and carry on so I don't get distracted by all these, these needs. So I think that that could be one way we could support each other um, if we are doing stuff on the web um, is, is by thinking about you know, not just the human interface, but the, the machine interface for, uh, for other tools. So, um, yeah, when, when, like when the first version of, uh, of Modeler, we actually, I hired um, a young guy um, from Enthought um, to come sit with me in my garden shed where my office was at the time um, for a week in Nova Scotia. And um, so it, basically for five days. And that was kind of an investment I was prepared to make in, in ha hacking together a more robust version of that, that first iteration. And I'm really glad I did that because it meant that we had this foundation right from the beginning of really solid code. You know, the guy was fantastic, knew exactly what he was doing. And, um, you know, it's like some of the best money I've ever spent. When I think of some of the other things I've spent money on as a small business owner, uh, it's definitely one of the one of the greatest investments. So you know, it was all like documented in Sphinx and all nicely properly done in GitHub and PyPI and all this sort of thing. And uh, I could never have pulled that off on my. Well, I mean, it would have taken me not just ten times as long, like a hundred times as long to pull that off on my own. And it. You know, while we did leave the project alone for months, it meant that when we came back to it, it was super easy to pick it back up again. It wasn't like, what is all this chaos? It was actually just really straightforward. Um, and yeah, we decided right at the beginning to go with a web app, because as I say, we wanted this web API for our mobile um, apps. Um, but I, I've worked in subsurface software for quite a while. I used to work for one of the Halliburton software divisions. And uh, sales companies are, I don't know, it's a pretty miserable place to work, to be honest. Um, you have these sales guys who are highly motivated to sell stuff and will essentially say anything to the customer um, to, to close a sale. And they're horribly overpaid, but also have horribly insecure jobs. Uh, I don't know how they do that sort of work. So as a small company, I'm like, well, I can't afford a sales guy. I don't want a sales guy. Um, you know, I want technical people. I want programmers. I want, uh, uh, and um, I want the sales channel to be as easy as possible. And we sell into oil and gas as one, one of the sort of verticals that we sell into. And, you know, it can be like a two-year sales cycle of not just like meetings, but taking people to hockey games and this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, and meanwhile, you're at trade shows showing people your awesome stuff and they're going, wow, that's really cool. I wish I could do that. And it's like, well, I, you know, I can't even give you a demo because they're not allowed to install anything on their machines. And it's basically just a pretty horrible situation, I, I think, for, for trying to sell desktop apps. So, um, so yeah, basically get it on the web, get it into actual users' hands, um, sort of disintermediate these gatekeeper purchases um, in these uh, technical organizations, and, um, and get it on the web. Um, and then, yeah, so for the, for the end user, potentially, it's quite a simple subscription. They can get their credit card out. It's not a $50,000 a seat license. Uh, in our case, it's $9 a month, which is a massively sort of, um, uh, you know, well, OK, the tool doesn't do very much right now, so maybe it is a fair price. Um, but but the, sort of, <laughs> the, sort of, um, the sort of stuff that we're competing with in principle, like the, the workflows that we're competing with, those tools cost $50,000 kind of thing um, and, and have all this sales baggage. So um, and anyway, there's lots of other things, of course, you get for free on the web, like you can push um, updates uh, all the time and um, fix bugs and uh, play with you know, sending people to different versions of the app or giving people, serving different pages to people, having your own dev environment, all the awesome user statistics that you can get from the web. Like it's just a, um, for us it's a sort of no-brainer. Um, yeah, so, and this is just a, a screenshot from, from the app, so uh, I'll, I'll describe a little bit of sort of what it, what it does in a minute. Um, <laughs> I sort of hesitate a bit to talk about the architecture because, you know, we're, we're, like we're not computer scientists. Let's just make that clear. Um, <laughs> geoscientists kind of grown like this by accident a little bit. It's partly by design. Um, we, uh, we're... 
like we believe very much in open source uh, stuff, right? So there's a sort of principle there that the scientific part of the application should not be a black box, that it should be, you should be able to inspect the code. Um, so we've sort of got this two-headed uh, beast of a back-end server where all the science happens, uh, which has a web API, uh, and then a front-end web application, which is closed source and proprietary, um, and uh, looks after the sort of payments and user database and, you know, all that kind of stuff, the front-end stuff. And, and I don't know, for, for better or worse, the, the back end essentially knows nothing about the front end. It doesn't know anything about users. It doesn't know anything about sessions or anything like that. It's just it, it gets asked for models and it gives, gives out models. Um, and in a way, that would be all well and good, but of course then when you want to start doing cooler and cooler things on the front end, you end up with this kind of front front end of the browser and now there's code in there because you want to do things in JavaScript. And so now we've got JavaScript widgets that are sort of having to navigate their way all the way back through to the back end, which knows nothing about what they actually want. So anyway, it's ended up being uh, a little bit of an engineering challenge, especially for Ben, who's our sort of main awesome guy. The, the other two of us sort of just sit there and say, hey, it'd be really cool if we could. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so yeah, the back end is completely open source. Uh, it's running on an Amazon EC2 server, um, partly just because that's uh, I'd started running wikis on Amazon EC2. I really liked it. I knew how to do it. Um, so that was what we went with. And of course, these little decisions, it's like, well, that'll do for now. Uh, you know, two years later, that's this is basically still what you're doing. Um, and uh, so using several libraries there, one of them, Agile Geo, is our sort of burgeoning library of um, geophysical stuff. So around things like computing the reflectivities and convolution and that kind of thing. Um, so those are all open source. And then the front end running on App Engine, uh, which is fantastic. Um, I can't keep up with Google's cloud offering. Uh, I, I subscribe to, I'm not sure what I subscribe to, like blogs and stuff from Google. And it feels like every single day I get something going, hey, now you can do this. And I'm like, I still haven't read the thing from two weeks ago. Um, you know, so there's like push to deploy and um, managed VMs and all this kind of thing. And, and I think that you can do some really cool things now, <laughs> like have an App Engine-like server with a bit more freedom, so not quite as much of a walled garden, um, not quite so controlled. Because App Engine's like only Python 2.7, and you get the Matplotlib you get, and the Matplotlib doesn't run on the dev server, and all these kind of complications. So, um, and then right next to it, you can kind of co-locate a back-end-like thing um, that's literally on the same hardware. So all the latency that we experience between these two things would sort of go away. Um, yeah, and as I say, this bit's proprietary, and um, it's uh, we're using a few other bits and pieces, um, uh, libraries for doing things like payments and recognizing images and stuff like that. And then there's this front end piece, that, like I say, the JavaScript in the browser. So we're really excited about Bokeh um, as, a, as a way potentially to sort of release us a bit from having to learn too much JavaScript and not change our matplotlib oriented backend uh, too much either. Um, there's a couple of principles at work in our software, like some of the things that we kind of carry through all of our consulting work and the way that we design apps and things. One of them is that every single parameter should have uncertainty, basically, um, that there should be no, it should be impossible to make a deterministic model, basically. Uh, and that is not the case right now. We haven't actually fully <laughs> figured out quite how to, um, uh, well, it's not so much a case of making these things. The problem is, how do you show the user, here's your 500 realizations? Um, so uh, that, that, that's the main challenge there. Um, but s some things we are doing probabilistically. So this is just like uh, Monte Carlo simulation of those reflectivities I was telling you about. Well, those reflectivities vary with the incidence angle of, this, of the uh, seismic wave. Um, so we can compute that angle-dependent reflectivity um, and, and compute it, in this case, uh, for you know, a couple of hundred realizations of, uh, of that, given some standard deviations for the, for the rock properties that I told you about earlier. Um, 
So that's, you know, that's actually pretty awesome. And, uh, you know, there aren't actually, even in the desktop tools, there aren't that many people doing that. So, you know, even though we're sort of tiny compared to the big um, desktop applications, I feel like there may be some small things we can do that do differentiate us um, and, and, you know, make the $9 a month seem, uh, seem awesome. <laughs> even more awesome than, you know, like a latte or whatever. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I guess the other thing is we really want the tool to be, um, you know, somewhat visual and, and, and as easy as possible to use. And so if something can be one button click, then we want it to be one, one button click kind of thing. Um, and that's a constant challenge, especially as you're trying to add features. So there's been one of the sort of... Like, you know, before this, we were only ever sort of putting together scripts for ourselves and doing our consulting work with scripts, so it doesn't matter what stuff looks like particularly. Um, it, you, it, having users and things, especially users who you don't meet. <laughs> you know, I mean, most of our users, we never hear from them. I mean, you know, uh, and, and even when we reach out to them directly, you don't hear from them. Um, uh, and, you know, they're just sort of the silent majority. And... Um, it's, uh, yeah, so it's, um, it's tough kind of learning what works, what doesn't work. You don't always get sort of direct feedback. Um, but anyway, so this, this is w one of the ways we have of building a, mo a model. So we need a, a way for a person to say, here's my model Earth, that I'm going to forward model through that seismic uh, process. Um, so this is, you know, as few parameters as possible. They're a little bit clunky. What's, so one example of the, that funky architecture is that... Um, the front, the, the front end just asks the back end, hey, uh, what, what script have you got for building this uh, model and what are its parameters? And the back end goes, oh, here's, here's my script parameters. So um, the front end just has a space for this, these script parameters to kind of be served up. Um, so these, aren't, these forms aren't baked into the front end at all. They're actually being given to the front end by that um, server running on uh, the EC2 thing. So, so this is actually us making an array, essentially. Um, but we can't programmatically make models like this. So the, the, this is a w way that a user can draw a picture, essentially, uh, or take a picture on their phone, even, and just upload that and use that as the model. So what we do here is sort of bit, bit reduce the image to some small, uh, finite <laughs> number of rocks. And then we ask them to assign rocks to the different colors in the picture in a completely arbitrary way. And they can then save that. And then they just have to tell the tool what the real world dimensions of the model are, and the, the tool can model them um, you know, with some seismic wavelet and so on. It's just a convolutional model right now. Um, we do want to um, we do want to like bring a finite difference engine into here so we can do full waveform uh, imaging. Um, but you know, these are just plans for the future kind of thing. And then we serve back a little bit of metadata, some these are elastic moduli of the rocks involved in the model. Um, yeah, and anyway, I, already, I won't labor this point about this uh, sort of extended pipeline. Yeah, the future stuff, um, we want people to be able to upload logs. There's definitely some nervousness in the industrial community around web apps and the cloud and do I really want my data there and that kind of thing. So we're kind of taking that one step at a time. Um, so on the left, that's the subsurface, a measured log. So we want people to be able to model that real data. And then this is a finite difference code actually from Leo. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to read these things out to you. You can, if you're interested in these sort of lessons learned, if you are building a web app or something like, there's so many funky things. Like especially these things uh, down here, the, the easy things that look hard and the hard things that look easy. It's like, you know, oh, we're taking credit card payments. We should do this on HTTPS. That that'll be easy. And it's like, well. You know, not necessarily. And as soon as we'd got HTTPS all sorted out with our certificates in place and everything, and Heartbleed happened, and it's like, oh, we have to do all that again. Awesome. <laughs> so I really know how to do it. Um, and, and again, that part of the complexity came from being in something like App Engine, you know, being in the walled garden where you don't have complete control over the server. Um, yeah. And so anyway, if you are thinking about building web apps or any of this sort of sounds or feels familiar, do reach out to us. We're more than happy to share everything we've learned or, or, or whatever. And, you know, and don't be surprised if we have a bunch of questions for you in return because we're still trying to figure this stuff out. Um, 
I do want to talk about what next for the community, but I think I'll leave that to later if we've got some time. And for now, I'll stop there and take any questions you guys have.